Okay, so with that, uh, I will start my screen share. Great. Okay, so uh, I'm Daniel Shanahan, uh, Dan Shanahan, and I'm in in Northwest Ohio. I'm in the Toledo area, and uh, in addition to the cookies, I've been doing. I, I first found FileMaker in 1991. I was I was I had a job just out of college in Durango, Colorado, and and uh, somebody introduced me to to FileMaker as a way of keeping track of some data. And so I used it like many people here. I had another job. I wasn't a computer person, uh, but I had this job and, and FileMaker was a great tool. So I went through some, um, some professional changes in 2007 and I became a junior developer. I worked for one of the, uh, one of the larger FBA, uh, Platinum partners in California and then and then I uh, started New Leaf Data. So we'll get to we'll get to that. Um, I want to talk about inventory. I have this framework. I've built a framework, an inventory management system. And for the next thirty minutes or so, I want to I want to have this conversation about what I have built and and in, entice you, if I can, to use this on your next inventory project. Here's, uh, I'm sorry, I have, to, I have to move something. There's a Zoom thing that's right in the middle of my, oh, I lost my, I lost my mouse. That happens sometimes when I'm sharing. Um, let me let me go through some of these things pretty quickly. The most, the important thing is that in 2016, so I've been develop, developing professionally since 2007, New Leap Data in 2008, but in, in 2016, I focused just on inventory management. And I started to produce some content for inventory management. For instance, I have this website called filemakerinventoryresources.com. It has about, I don't, I don't know, about 35 articles, and I think there's 13 demo files on that. I have a number of FileMaker inventory videos on YouTube. I had um, I had this site FileMaker Inventory Starter, which had a shell file and some courses. That's no longer available. But all of that is a culmination into trace inventory, which is what I want to talk about tonight. Here's a brief outline of what I want to talk about. I'm going to do a little kind of a funny thing about the the development process. I want to talk about inventory flow. The opportunity is what I would hope you would consider, and I'll do a demo. I want to hear a little testimonial. There's there's somebody here who is uh, considering using trace inventory on their next project, and so I want to give them the floor for a few minutes. So that's how we will that's how we will go. The demo really, when I'm with a prospective client, uh, the demo can take anywhere from hour and an hour and a half to two hours if if we go in depth. So we don't have that kind of time and. And I'm not sure it would be of that. I'm not sure how much interest that would be. So if you're interested in inventory and you have something particular you would like to see, think about that right now. And then when we get to the demo part, you can you can jump in and say, what about this scenario? Do you handle serial numbers? Do you handle lot numbers? How do you handle how do you handle multiple receipts against a purchase order? Whatever the thing would be. Um, then let's do that. I have this Q&A at the end, but really just, just jump in with questions at any time. You're very welcome to interrupt me. Here's the, I like to start with this picture, this, this, the development process. This should be familiar to most of us. You might use this or something similar to it. I like it, it's nice, it's pretty, has pretty colors, it's very clear. It's fun to share this with our, with our uh, prospective client. Uh, let them know that we can we can get the job done. But in reality, uh, the projects sometimes turn out like this. Especially long projects. Long projects are hard. And inventory projects can be long. I can help with the template that I've built, the framework that I've built. Uh, but first, what I want to do is just have a an overview on what we're talking about with inventory management. Inventory management, very simply, is we're talking about bringing things into your 
organization, some kind of item or SKU, moving it around within the organization, and then leaving the organization. Now, it might look more like this. It might look like empty shelves. Then you get a purchase order. Then you receive it and you put it away. You could replenish the shelves. That is, you might receive items in bulk, but you pick them by the unit. So you have to have your bulk place somewhere and your picking bin somewhere else. And one of the advantages of trace inventory is we, we can track multiple locations. So a single SKU can be stored in multiple locations. Uh, when it goes out, it can create an estimate. The estimate can turn into a sales order. The sales order gets picked, it gets shipped, and then it gets invoiced. Now, the purchasing, bringing things in, the purchase orders is not the only way to bring something in. You also might have a return from customer. You might have, you might receive a transfer from another warehouse from within your organization. And of course, you might have, you might have an assembly that uh, the finished product needs to be received from all of the build products. Likewise, when things go out, sales order is just one example. Those bill of materials that make up that finished product those have to get marked as going out so that you can keep your inventory quantities uh, accurate. You also can move from one uh, warehouse to another and you can return something to a vendor. So it can get pretty complicated. And, and the whole, all the while, you wanna have some kind of log that tracks the movement of the inventory, some kind of transaction log. All of this has to be built. So if you're just building from scratch, that's a lot of modules that you would have to build. And I would remind you of what a long project can look like. So I'm proposing that you start with a framework and I'm suggesting that you start with my framework, Trace Inventory. I think this is a win-win-win situation. For those of you who are professional developers, uh, your customer is looking for, uh, has a problem and they wanna get it solved fast. Every installation needs customization. If they don't need, if they, if they have inventory needs and they don't need customization, then FileMaker is probably not their platform. But the strength of FileMaker is that you have the customization. And then of course, I'm selling this through a subscription. Let me put trace inventory in context. This is really any, any place in any, any um, uh, product in FileMaker, but it, it certainly works well in inventory. There's, there's the, the enterprise systems, and these are big and expensive. There's a lot of risk to them. They can take years to implement. There are web-based systems. There are really some, there are some nice web-based systems. And when I have conversations with people and they tell me they, if they have a, a budget that's maybe $5,000 or, or they, um, they don't have many customization needs, I think they, they would be better served on the web-based systems. There's some nice ones out there. They have their disadvantages. Uh, you, you, you can't really customize them. You, could, you can maybe modify a report and and add some fields, but, but you're not really gonna add modules. And trace inventory fits nicely right in the middle. Okay, so that was my quick slide deck. Now I'm gonna do a, a demo of trace and I'm happy to, to see what you'd like to see, to hear what you'd like to see. So this is trace inventory. This is, I'll, st I'll start with the, the menu items. The menu items, um, again, again, the inventory flow is, is simply bringing things in, moving things out, moving things around, and then sending things out. And we have that here in Trace. We could start with a purchase order. We could receive the purchase order. We could put the purchase order away. We also have uh, moving things out with an estimate order or sales order, pick, ship, and invoice. 
And then we can move things around. For example, if we have uh, an SKU in multiple locations, we can replenish a, a, a bin location from another location. And of course, we could transfer from different warehouses. This is what the item layout looks like. The, um, in trace inventory, the, this light blue section is set to, in all, of, in all of the layouts, whether it's a purchase order or a sales order or the item layout, this light blue section is meant to give some, uh, the most important information that a user needs just in the first few seconds that they land on the record. And then it's, and it's clean. So there's a lot more information that we need to know about the item, but it's, but it's not on the layout. So it's not overwhelming to the user. All of those things are put up here in this more section. So for instance, we have, you can have multiple documents, including uh, documentation on a build, if it's a finished good or images or um, routing instructions. You can have, you can relate this to other items. For example, you could have a substitution. In a substitution scenario, you would have items that um, if you have a stock out, for example, and you don't want to lose the sale, you could say, well, we don't have AMOX 81, but we do have this ASET 04, and that, would you like that instead? We also have uh, an upsell section uh, module, which is also related to other, other items. So this is, um, you're familiar with this from Amazon where you say people who bought this also like that. There's a vendor section. The vendor section, you can have multiple vendors for the item and the vendor section has quite a bit of flexibility with it. And in this example, what I show is that uh, First of all, the vendor's SKU or item code might be different than your SKU. And trace inventory can handle that. The other thing is that a, a vendor might have a requirement of a minimum purchase. So in this case, what I have is that this uh, bubble box has a minimum purchase of one case, but you sell it by each unit. And so there's a conversion that happens here. And so when you receive, so when you order something, you can order something by the case and that's what the vendor wants to see, how many cases. But when you receive it, you'll be able to receive it by the unit and that will keep the inventory quantities accurate. And I don't know that this would ever happen in real life. This is all dummy data, but, but um, you, can, you can define that however you'd want. So in these two cases, I have different conversion numbers. I don't know if that would ever happen but again, there's uh, just to show flexibility. Then there's a preferred vendor. Those are the two that we saw and, and our numbers uh, change over here. Uh, the quantity is the other big piece for trace inventory. And you can see the quantity numbers at the top. So at the quantity numbers at the top, we track the on hand, what's in the, what's in the facility, allocated, what has been promised on a sales order or a transfer order or uh, an assembly build, what's available to sell, uh, what's on order from our vendor and what's on back order to the customer. And we could see that in multiple warehouses. Here I have one in Durango and one in Sylvania. And inside that warehouse, I can have multiple locations for that SKU. So very, very flexible as far as knowing not just how many units you have, but where are those units and what, are the, what is the status of that unit? There's a history log. We'll take a look at the transactions in a moment, uh, but the history log every time that, uh, now I don't have anything but, a purchase, but an opening balance, but every time that a purchase order is created, every time that it's received, Every time that it's used in an assembly, all of that creates a transaction record and you can access that from the history log. Uh, some, some will have serial numbers. We'll take a look at serial numbers and some will have lots. This one doesn't, so, so obviously we can't see anything in that. We have some very simple KPIs. Uh, we can manage locations, seasonality. I'm running through this pretty quickly because I, uh, I just want to do some highlights and then 
pause for questions as they arise. Seasonality might be again if you're selling if you're selling um, uh, chocolate chips or or flour or something or something that makes Christmas cookies. You might sell a lot of those at Christmas time, but you might not sell that many in January, February, or March. So in seasonality, you have the option of determining what is my minimum quantity, which affects this minimum quantity over here, but you might determine it based on, on the year or based on the quarter or based on the month. Um, uh, there's a barcode in here that you can, you can adjust. Uh, very flexible. I use a barcode in a couple of different ways. Then there's the there's an assembly process. So the assembly process can be used for not just for assembly. So you could you could build a finished good or a work in progress or sub assembly with the assembly process. But you can also use it for kits. So if you're doing any kind of kitting or bundling, then the assembly order can be used. And we can see. So this particular one is a raw material. I could see it's a raw material back here. A raw material can have a, a bill of materials, but it can be used in other places. And so if it was used in other places, we would see a list of all the other SKUs where this is consumed. There's a bill of material tree. This is a multi-level bill of material. And it, um, so sometimes you wanna see what is not just my first level dependencies, but what are my dependencies at the third, fourth, sixth, seventh level. And then I can, and then there's, um, what are the tasks required to build this item? Um, let me go, let me do a find for a serial number. In this particular unit, in this particular SKU, serial numbers are stored. And we can, we can bring in serial numbers and anytime the serial number moves, we can track that as well. So every time that it's, it's brought in, received, anytime it's allocated for a sales order, and then whenever it goes out, all of that gets marked. And let's find lots. And, and um, so you might have an SKU, if you're tracking lots, you can have an SKU and you can have multiple lots and, and those units are also tracked. Let me go over to the transactions. In the, tra um, let's see, this is probably a little bit more we need. Um, in the transaction, we'll start with this. The transactions is the transactions are a log that 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 create a record every time a movement occurs. So in this case, we're looking at this simple item, this widget, and it gets ordered. And so we have this log of where it gets ordered and the purchase order. And we can see that this purchase order, we had three other items for that purchase order. And if I go down here to uh, to this, this one, click on this focus. So we could see, we could see the story of this, this SKU at this warehouse. And so for this story, we could see that at this timestamp, this was the quantity. Not, uh, we didn't have any on hand, so we had to order them. And then we received them. So now we had them on hand and they weren't on order anymore and then they were put away. So now we have those five units are now on hand and they're available to be used. The rest of the, the, rest of the layouts look pretty similar, something that you would, you would expect. There's, there's a purchase order, sales order, estimate order, where you have header information, and then you have a bunch of line information. And so on all the, all the orders, you have all of these statuses that roll across the top and tell the user what status they're in. Again, this light blue section is meant to be a really quick area of 
where the user uh, can see to, to, to see what's, what's needed. So the purchase order number, the status, the grand total. And then there's navigation within. So, so I can easily move throughout this process by these, these left carrots. So I could see that this was received here and I could jump over to that receipt order. When it gets received, I can receive in the lots. I could also receive in the serial numbers. So all of that gets tracked. A lot of data gets tracked on this. The other thing about that, oh, I, so that's the put, the put away. Um, let, me, let me navigate back to the purchase order and mention that a purchase order, a purchase order can be received in, in multiple shipments. So if you, ordered, if you ordered 10 widgets and your vendor only sent seven widgets, so you're expecting the three other widgets, that can still get marked against the purchase order in the data structure here. Let me do a quick, I'll just do a real quick uh, look at the outgoing side of the sales order. It looks very similar to the, the purchase order. Header information, line information, status at the top, uh, immediate data that we need to see once we, we land on the record. And I can navigate through the process. These are process buttons at the bottom. And I, could, I can navigate through and see the story about how, what happened to this, to this order. And the other piece I wanna highlight is uh, this assembly order. So on an assembly order, and again, an assembly order can work for a, a build of a finished good, can work for a sub-assembly or work in progress, but it can also work for kitting, if you're doing kitting or bundles or packages. And the idea is that you would have, have this item that you wanna build, and then these are all the things, all the things that have to be consumed in order to build that item. And so if I want to build 20 of these units, I know what I need to consume for one unit of build. So I multiply that out and here's what I need for 40 of those. And I can see what I have available. And I also have, again, some really simple data here to say, what are the tasks that are required for me to complete this? Those are also marked uh, this will be the last thing though, I'll, and then we'll start the conversation. Those are also marked here where an item is requested. So this docs and mess is, um, is the finished good that gets built. And then the, the assembly items that are required for that build are listed as a transaction as well. So these items, these items get consumed. Oh, that was a Doxmas. So on this one, this this Adam fifty six, I need ten of those units in order to build that Doxmas. So in the assembly process, there's a start assembly process and a completion assembly process. So the starting of the assembly process takes the units that I need for consumption and it moves them into allocation. And then at the completion of the process, those units have been consumed. They don't exist anymore. So if you're trying to build a bicycle and you have a frame and you have wheels and you have a chain, all those things exist separately. But as soon as you have a finished bike, those wheels don't exist as a separate unit anymore. They've been consumed. And the transactions track all of that. That's a high, that's a very high overview of, of trace inventory as a framework. Um, I wanna hear uh, questions, open it up for conversation. And now it could be that, it could be that this, this particular community doesn't come across um, inventory solutions all that much, I don't know. But um, I know that uh, Thomas and Teresa have been working with, with a, a, a potential client and, 
And so I'd like to hand it over to them and, I, and maybe they could just say a few words about what they, why they thought to, um, to consider trace. So um, thanks, Dan. I appreciate the uh, the demo. Oh, very nice. Yeah. Um, so uh, we work with a variety of clients, and uh, one that we have right now is a what do they do? Logistics. A lot of logistics. Anyway, yeah. they have an inventory need, and they also have a need for a database in general because their business is currently being run by spreadsheets and fox pro and fox pro <laughs> yeah i saw that wow yeah, yeah. <laughs> so. so um turns out uh that's that's getting very difficult to update right so they uh they'd contacted us about building a custom solution and then we talked to dan about trace since the vast majority of what they need is inventory management um, moving, moving, tracking large, the movement, tracking the movement of large product. Yeah. And we had done, uh, Teresa and I had done a podcast, uh, about a year ago on starter solutions. And that was, uh, looking at more general starter solutions, just, mm -hmm. uh, CRM type stuff. But the, but the ideas were the same where what you want to look for is a solution that you know meets a high percentage of what what you need so that a lot of the work is already built and you also want something where the back end makes sense to you as a developer and fits your own development style mm -hmm. and um we I've, I've known dan for a while and i've seen the back end of his stuff before and it fits it's it's very close to what we do it's different but it's close enough that it's it's a trivial thing for us to uh, switch over to that style, and uh, and Trace fits that. So uh, potentially saving our client money, uh, definitely speeding up the development process. So that's that's the main reasons we were looking at Trace in particular, but a, um, some sort of a framework to start with. And they were they're coming from nothing. So it's not like we have a half a FileMaker system built already and we're looking for something to attach. It's it's nice to be starting from scratch. But thank you, Thomas and Teresa. Um, I am I see in the chat Eric had a question uh, sticking with the example about related items. Um, I should say that all the date the demo data is all fictitious. It they're they're really the real things are their medical things, but I'm not in the medical field. And so it's just, so if you know medicine, some of that demo data might not make any sense at all. And that's because I don't know medicine. It's just to, to um, highlight the functionality. So I hope that answers your question, Eric. Any, anybody else have any questions or thoughts or insights? Hey, Kim. Hi. Um, I just wanted, one I wanted to tell you, since I've been in the plumbing industry for 33 years. So and so you did a very nice job because I use every single one of those things that you mentioned. We have bombs, we have kits, we have mm -hmm. just everything you did. That's what we do. So you did a nice job. And I, so I, so to Thomas, I think that's a great starter solution. And you are absolutely correct that that it needs to be customized because mm -hmm. we just spent a long time customizing ours. I've and if you want to do SAP, I looked at NetSuite. Um, you know, you better have uh, well SAP. You better have a million dollars, but um, <laughs> if you want to do customizations, but NetSuite, I mean that's a that's a few hundred grand, and um, so. We have 45 users and I built an in-house system that complements our enterprise system. So it's also, you know, we go into research items and, you know, so there's quoting, purchase, like everything for purchase source. So I just wanted to compliment you on that. That's a very nice job. 
So Thomas, I approve. <laughs> thank, well, thank, thank you. That means a lot to me, actually. <laughs> yeah, because, well, you know, that's what I do. Yeah. That's what I do. So, yeah. All right. Bye. And uh, one the, a real small thing, Dan, I was, uh, when we were watching and the barcode thing came up, I asked Teresa, I'm like, oh, does it generate the barcodes? And she's like, I don't remember, ask them. So I'm asking. <laughs> it does. Yes, it does generate the barcode. The barcode oh. currently is, it gets generated into a web viewer. So, so right away you can figure out there's, uh, it depends on how you want to print it. Again, implementing this, as Kim pointed out, it's, is customized. So how, how big a barcode, what kind of barcode are they using? So maybe a web viewer would be okay. Maybe it would have to get moved into a container field. So there's development that would have to, to hand, be handled there. Sure. But it sure. does, but it does, that's right. It does work on the, on the, um, I have the, I have it in, I think three different places. I have a barcode for the SKU, I think a barcode for the lot. And I know I have a barcode for the serial numbers and they're all generated. They're all generating based on different values. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, maybe that's about it. If that's it, I would like to um, backpedal a little bit. When I started this, I had this in mind, but I didn't write it down, and I and I totally uh, dropped the ball on that. And I I want to say that um, connecting to Eppenberg was really through Laura. Laura and I are connected on LinkedIn, and I had I had asked her about it. And she said she didn't know. And then she would she would run off. She'd find the answer. Then she'd connect with me. And then she get she got everything. She got uh, the link that I needed. She got the time. She did all the all the legwork. It was fantastic. So thank you. So I want to publicly thank you, Laura, because it was it was just really really easy to do. So thank you so much for that. No problem. You're welcome. <laughs> Laura is the best, and Todd is so lucky to have her. <laughs> Yes, he is. <laughs> Good. Unless there's other questions. Um, or yeah, I have, I have yeah, sure. another question. Ask me. My first question was to, to ask Kim to comment on this and how it worked with what she knew. But my second question is: um, Could we look at some of the guts of this? Could we look at what at at the main um, graphs of the objects that go with your main task layouts or something like that? I'd be happy to do that, uh, to see things underneath. Is that what you're asking, Jill? Yes. Yeah, I'd be happy to do that. Specifically so have, one of the object graphs. Let's see, what have we got here? Uh, so I have, I use custom menus. And so I have to get it out of my custom menu. Um, but I'll just do, I'll do a real quick view from left to right on the, on the, um, yeah, great. The tables tables yep. and, and relationships. That's yeah. right. So here, Good. yep. Here are my tables. I uh -huh. use a table mm -hmm. template. I don't use I don't use a, the the five or six pre made. Uh, my naming convention is a little different, so I have a table template that I use. All mm -hmm. uppercase, no spaces, and uh, fields are. Um, here's my default fields. Uh, this that's nothing really new there, and. Um, I'll, let me point out, let me go back to tables. Most of the tables, um, so the global has 91, everything is under 100. They're all pretty small tables. So I have narrow tables. That's the goal is to have narrow mm -hmm. tables that I wanted. Mm -hmm. uh, here's my naming convention for fields is that so it's lower camel case. I have some constants in here. I have a few uh, globals where I appended at the, at the back. And um, I don't do any other appending as far as if it's a, a number field or a calculation. I don't do any of that. Uh, but I do have some constants. I do have some Booleans. And the other thing that I would point out, and I, I feel like I'm talking fast, but I just want to go through this quickly, is that I have very, very, very few calculations, very few summary fields. So almost everything is an index number. You can see that mostly on the, on the quantity field. This is where all the, this is the aggregate table of all your quantities at the on hand, the available, the allocated. This is where all that data lives. And it's, it's all index numbers. And the advantage of that, of course, you guys all know this, but if I want to go in and I want to say, show me everything from this particular item category where we have over you know, 5,000 units, I could do that. I could do that query and it's fast. 
<laughs> the relationship graph is a hybrid. It is not anchor buoy. It's a hybrid of anchor buoy uh, between anchor buoy and the unified. And I know this is small, but I, I would just point out that here's a, um, this the base table I have are in blue. So base tables are in blue. And of course, in anchor buoy, this is you can't have a base table in the second level or the third level in anchor buoy. So it's a hybrid of both of those. And the advantage of the hybrid is I have fewer table occurrences on the graph. Mm -hmm. I haven't done any of those benchmarks, but I'm I'm relying on work done by Mark Richmond that indicates that it's it's less. And the other thing to note is that just because I create a table doesn't mean I, I, I don't feel obligated to connect that table to anything, even if it has relationships. So I use execute SQL quite often. And, and when I need to use a relationship, I build it. I'm not, I'm not opposed to having relationships, but my default is that it's just here and I'm not gonna build a relationship until I need it. And my mm -hmm. goal and I haven't done any benchmarking on this, but my goal is to keep the relationship graph as, as lean as I can in the hopes of performance. Scripting is, um, is organized in, in folders. Um, not sure what to say about scripting, but, um, but they're in folders. And there's a, have you guys discovered this bug here in 19? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, Bit of a no, no, no. Oh, yeah, very annoying. Yeah. Um, and scripts are in alphabetical order once you get into that area. Um, a little README if I, if I thought it was helpful. The other thing that I would say is I have, um, let's see, I have, I've just started working on this developer documentation. I have documentation for the end user. And that's on, mm -hmm. that's on the support page. But I just started using, I just started writing down documentation for the developer in the hopes that if somebody were to purchase this for their own client, I want them to have some resource besides me where they could go and find out. So for example, I have, here's something on the naming conventions that we just, mm -hmm. we just looked at. And here's something on the relationship graph, that kind of thing. Is that helpful, Jill? Yes, very. And in fact, um, you know, uh, um, some, some of my early training was in physics. And physicists are really big on having simple concepts and simple equations, although there are areas where you'd never know that. But, but that's, that's the goal. And it, quite explicitly, it's that if, if your mental model of things is pretty simple, then you can build on top of that to do new things. And it's very much worth doing that. And this, this, this was one of the greatest times when somebody really had something to demo and you really could put up um, your relationship graphs. And, you know, I couldn't see every detail, but, but it was just not spaghetti all over the place, which I'm afraid <laughs> is what mine are like. <laughs> So yeah, I think that's great. I think that has a lot of advantages. Good, thank you. Any other thoughts or comments or questions? Then Todd, I will hand it back to you. All right, and I guess I will just hand it right over to Fritz so you can go ahead and uh, give us a tour of the solution you guys do use there at UPMC. Okay, I'm gonna share my screen. Oh, there it goes. Okay, so uh, I want to just start by showing you what what I'm all about. I come from a design background. Um, I'm a graduate of Carnegie Mellon's uh, Industrial Design Department, 1990. Um, I then went out to LA and I worked for a very famous graphic designer called Saul Bass. Um, doing logos and um, product design. Um, then went to, um, decided that uh, LA wasn't really my thing and uh, moved to Switzerland to go to graduate school. So uh, I'm basically come at this from a um, 
industrial design, graphic design standpoint, here are some of the things that I've done in the past, just so you uh, guys can, can see that I, I am not a developer. Um, Although I'm very, um, I'm very interested in it. I'm, I'm, uh, I would describe myself as, uh, you know, intermediate at best. And um, I totally rely on Thomas uh, Makwa to and Teresa um, to help me do the back end of stuff. So. I am not a coder, but you'll see in my FileMaker um, presentation that I um, am very into user interface and uh, making making things work from um, you know the lowest common denominator, which is someone that's never used FileMaker and wants to um, you know basically not have to worry about a whole bunch of stuff and learn a bunch of of code or anything. So these are some examples of the things I've done in architectural signage, corporate identity, um, product design, and uh, information design, really. Um, you know, I've done things for uh, uh, the ski industry. Um, there's a, you know, I can, I can send you guys all the, all the, uh, the link to this later. <laughs> or maybe um, the meeting organizers can. Um, but there's, there's a number of uh, uh, things that inform my, um, uh, inform the discipline really in, in FileMaker um, because I look at it as basically a, a graphic tool that can uh, really present information in the right way. And um, I'm interested more in how you get there as a user, than um, than actually coding the back end, right? Um, there's a lot of things around here that um, I've done in Pittsburgh. Um, just so you know, uh, in case uh, some of you are not from from Pittsburgh, uh, UPMC is a UP, University of Pittsburgh Medical Center. Um, it's been around for in its current form for probably 30 years. Um, and at the moment, it's uh, Pittsburgh's biggest employer and also Pennsylvania's largest employer, uh, 95,000 employees from corporate to uh, medical staff. Um, this is gonna be a run through of, of the, the three applications um, that, uh, I designed and built with help from from Thomas, and I'm gonna, uh, you know, he's he's a frequent collaborator, and um, uh, I will say that I uh, learned FileMaker from the standpoint of uh, screen layouts. Uh, I love layouts. I like grids. I like guidelines, and um, the um, the thing I want most for FileMaker to uh, allow in their app is web fonts, please. Um, I am tired of having to do cross-platform work um, with a choice of seven possible fonts because uh, graphic design is, you know, much more involved than that. And um, it, it really is kind of a hindrance, uh, although I found ways to get around it. Um, we do have a kind of a closed system. There's probably maybe 15 users, um, but we have um, delusions of grandeur to, to sort of um, sell this to our department and, and make it um, so that there's more like 100 or 200 users. Um, so I'll just, I'm gonna just start by going through this. Um, we have a, uh, as I said, 95,000 employees, over 1,700 individual sites, um, about 40 of which are hospital campuses. Um, and the other, the rest of them are satellites from a doctor's office in a mini mall to um, 
you know, uh, departments inside hospitals, uh, you know, little doctor's offices in the middle of nowhere that are, are signed on to this system. Um, so we needed a way to basically go out uh, in the world and find out all of the data, uh, photographs of every piece of science. So I'll, I'll explain um, quickly that um, my group is, is uh, primarily about architectural signage, wayfinding, uh, site identification, and branding. Um, which is pretty important to UPMC. And we're one of the only uh, hospital systems in the country that actually has a dedicated signage team. Uh, we work with local vendors, um, you know, manufacturers, fabricators, design firms, and um, of course, developers like uh, Thomas and Teresa. Um, so the first thing we, we had to do was to make a um, iPad app using FileMaker Go that could very simply go out um, and have the user um, be able to photograph a site sign by sign. Um, and then also note um, a sort of predefined condition of um, site group, meaning a geographic collection of, of sites so that you don't get too confused. Um, and every single site having a unique site number. Um, and then within that, um, a series of um, tenants that might be in that site. Uh, so basically, the idea was to, um, how do we very, very quickly, and it's taken um, almost three years now, but we're pretty much done with, with auditing uh, these sites, which is what we call it. We go out and um, plan trips, uh, create site maps using Google Maps, and then go out there, uh, usually sending a, some sort of underling, um, like the guy in the picture. He's, he's a junior designer, um, but he's very useful uh, for doing these sort of things because we don't have um, time to go out and visit every single site. Um, so basically what we've, we've done is to create a, a multi, I call it a multi-purpose signage app. Um, and you can see in the tabs across of the, across the top there that you sort of start with the initial audit of a site and it has um, four containers for photos, um, tells you the exact location, um, again, there's a, there's a process for doing this. So typically someone would um, uh, start with uh, getting the site, finding out everything they can about it um, internally or externally uh, using either a uh, site plan from our architectural department or uh, just using a Google map and taking a, a, a paper printout um, of course, if you have an Apple Pencil and uh, Google Maps or PDF on your iPad, you can you can um, sort of mark these things down all digitally, but it's a real hassle. So the process is to go out to a site, collect all the information you can, um, including how many sides a sign has. Is it illuminated or not? Um, what is the overall size? What is the panel size? The panel size is important because most townships and um, uh, zoning commissions, uh, when you're, they have a limit as to the square, the overall square footage of the signage that is allowed for the township, and it all changes um, every time. Some townships, uh, specifically out east, um, Lidditz, Lancaster area, are sort of like Nantucket or Mar Martha's Vineyard in that they don't allow big garish signs. They like everything a certain height and it has to be very conservative and so on. So we need that information to um, basically determine um, the budgets uh, as far as what is allowed, what we can put in there, 
Um, and so uh, first call out to Thomas, he helped me do the calculation. If you can see below, the panel size of a, um, a sign is considered the visible area that you are allowed to put up. It doesn't matter uh, mostly about the legs that are ho holding it up or anything that the message itself, the square footage of the message panel itself is, is what is considered as the allowable space per township or, or town or city. So it really helps um, to have a, um, you know, calculation as to, uh, based on the width and height of, of a panel of a sign, um, where it automatically calculates, um, you know, what, what that sign, the square footage of that sign is, and also gives you the, the total for, for that entire site once you're done. Um, there's a number of things here that, that can be, um, uh, you know, customized um, per, per site. Some of the buttons you'll see below, you can save the auto audit photos. Um, this is, I'll tell you this, uh, in programming uh, large hospital sites for hundreds and hundreds of individual pieces of signage, can get really hairy. So um, I've introduced little uh, pieces in here um, that will aid us in our actual design programming of each site um, with uh, Adobe applications. Now I'm not saying that this thing connects directly with them, but it aids us because we can, in one fell swoop, we can take all audit photos and dump them into a folder. And that can take, you know, a lot of space. Um, or you can, you can, because sometimes what we do with these photos is we take them and uh, build a mock-up of that photo using the, the new sign to show the client what you can put in that space. So, uh, that's great, but what do you do with all this stuff? These, these files end up being very large and we have hundreds and hundreds of them, uh, you know, one for each site and one record for each sign. So what do you do with that? Well, you build a database to go along with it, to hold it all, right? So um, the next thing we did, um, was, uh, and this, and Thomas helped us to, to set this up, is uh, to, to build a database that has much more information than the actual audited app. Um, and I'll show you some screens uh, from there. But basically I wanted the, the audit app to be seamless. Um, and the process is you, you go out and you do your audit of a site, then you go home or to your office, uh, plug in the iPad to your computer and import the audit file directly to the server. So um, it's pretty seamless. Uh, we've made some changes um, that makes it not so seamless, but uh, I'll talk to you about that later, Thomas. Uh, that's one of our plans is, is to really get this thing um, so that it's it's uh, very easy for a user to come uh, plug in their iPad and effortlessly import all the data they've collected into the um, FileMaker cloud. So here's an example of uh, the server-based model, which is much more complex than than the the uh, FileMaker Go or what I call the the multi-sign app. Um, you can go through, if you look at the menu over on the left, you can see that there's a, a, a directory of sites. There's a dashboard that tells you everything about the real estate information. There's uh, branding info. Has the brand name been approved? Um, does it, you know, these are all critical information that helps people make decisions, especially project managers. Um, I, I'm not going to go through all the buttons um, as this presentation is more, I think about how you can make um, 
a, a database not be so vanilla and um you know no offense to to um all you uh, coding people not at all um and daniel i'm super impressed with your your work i i could see um tons of possibilities with that are really really cool but my my focus is more about um user interface and and usability um so i've introduced a lot of um i i use uh ping files for graphics um very into uh you know branding the the solution itself there's a an area where once you uh go in and do an audit uh, you can then go back once the manufacturer or the fabricator has has done the work um then there's an area here on the right where you can either accept it or reject it and then make a report, send it to the vendor and say, hey, you guys got to go fix this. And here's why. And here's what who's doing what. Um, this field here is is blank, as you can see, but um, the point is that this is sort of a rep repository of information that can be used in many different ways with uh, vendors, project managers, um, all to make sure that everyone's on the same page and that these things get done because as you know maybe um i don't know if you work with other vendors but unless you spell it out for them they're not going to get it and they'll do what they want to do and then you have to go back and say well okay well you guys got to eat the cost of fixing what you messed up because and it's not all messing up most of it goes really well but we find this very helpful um as a visual and, and uh, time-stamped record, basically of, okay, um, vendor responsibility. Um, there, that's mo most of the problems we have are, are with vendors not listening, although most of them are very good. <clears throat> Here's a diagram of, uh, and we're getting a little bit into the next part. So there's there's two databases actually. One of them is uh, deals specifically with uh, signage, locations, and property. So the property itself is is the mother, and all the children are the signs. Um, the and within a, a actually the mother is the is the site group which is a geographically organized um, group of 100 or less sites that uh, fall within a certain area or, or county. Um, so this shows, um, this, this diagram was done for management um, basically to show um, the relationships in a very simple way um, and how it works. Um, and this is one of my fortes too, is presenting information in a very um, graphic and, and simple way. So it sort of explains to, um, to someone, you know, that's interested, this is how it works. There's, there's the database, then the next thing is the site group, which is up in, the, in, in uh, this area, if you can see my hand. A little hand icon. Um, this area down here shows the little offshoot uh, things. So, so it it shows that a site group is um, basically a, a collection of site numbers, which um, tie to a physical address. And then under that, in the in the case of a hospital. Um, you know, we can do interior signage, exterior signage, um, and it shows all of the all of the tenants. Now, these tenants are very important because they link over to the right to our other database, which existed before I got to UPMC. So, um, but we've improved both of them. So, um, another thing that Thomas helped me with was to uh, link the two databases through a number of um, 
Well, I guess they've, uh, well, you explained, Thomas, it's a bunch of tables, right? <laughs> so I don't mean to sound, um, you know, like I don't know what's going on, but I, I am, am more, um, I'm, I'm very happy that I can work with a FileMaker developer to, to help me um, achieve these ideas because um, it's, it's really, um, linking a site to a project is essential because if you link a site to a project, then you can um, determine all sorts of things like budgets, um, the, the time it takes to, to do things, and um, we're still working on some reports to do that. So this just basically shows how the two link and why they're important to each other. So then on to Elroy. Um, Elroy is our project tracking database. Um, I believe, Thomas, and you can jump in here at any time, um, that you were pretty essential in building the initial version of Elroy. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, there was, there was a um, basically a flat FileMaker database built in version, I want to say five, mm -hmm. FileMaker five. And so we, we grew from that and right. that took a, a few years. Right. So if you, if, um, after this, if you want, I can jump into either of these and you can see the live database, but I, I just, um, since it was, I can't explain from a coding standpoint, um, how a lot of the stuff works. I, I understand um, uh, layouts and fields and tables, um, but as far as making relationships and calculations, uh, I leave that to um, my, my partners in crime here. Um, this is probably the fifth iteration of, a, um, of the uh, uh, startup screen. Uh, just so you know, Elroy and Astro you probably have figured out by now that it's a, it's a Jetsons reference. <laughs> um, I did not come up with those names. So, so the main screen of um, uh, when you have a, uh, a new project is to fill out this uh, form here. Um, it's all sort of color coded. It uh, encourages you from left to right to fill in certain things. Um, and uh, we can go back back to this, but basically uh, I wanted um, things to be very organized by um, simple columns, right? So we have a project description, you have associated sites, and that's where linking linking a project to a site in a separate database is, is very important. And um, and that is the area down on the on the left. Um, it's interesting that one of the requirements of this was to not only link one site to one project, but to link one site to several either several projects or link many projects to one site. And that was a bit of a, well, I think it was probably pretty difficult for Thomas, but we figured it out. So um, for example, uh, most, most projects are tied to one site. There are maybe 5% of projects that are one project that's tied to hundreds of sites. Like say, uh, for example, um, an initiative comes in for uh, the hospital system to build uh, gender neutral bathrooms. And this is a real project. Everyone was up in arms. They don't have the real estate for it. Um, there are only two bathrooms for men and women. Um, so, um, there was a project where we had to identify certain bathrooms on a floor as gender neutral. So the same sign had to be manufactured um, in 
very large quantities and shipped out to different hospitals or, or satellite locations. And that was an example where you would have, you know, maybe 30 or 40 sites linked to one project. And it, it was only one sign. Normally, you would have, um, you know, one project per site. That way you can track who's managing it, when it's due. Um, you, you'll see here there are project notes um, that um, display, um, once you add a note, you can assign a, a, a task to someone. Um, you can enter purchase orders. Um, and that's an, another important thing. I, I don't wanna get ahead of myself um, and I don't wanna take too much time for you guys, but it leads to other things. So once these things are, are uh, uh, entered, we can always look at a detailed project report per manager that shows what you have going on, when it's due, uh, what kind of project it is, what the priority level is. So um, this this whole solution is not so much designed for uh, ordering or 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 products or inventory, but it's more um, a personal tracking and reporting device. So that at the end of every month, we can look up an employee. Um, and this is um, another true, a, a true picture of collaboration between a designer and a coder, meaning me and Thomas. And, I, and I, we really have a great relationship. Um, I tell him what I want. I, I do about maybe 80% of the layout um, and I do things I know I can do. And I, I've learned from him. I've been to um, a bunch of uh, seminars with Todd and, and Thomas in Pittsburgh and I end up learning a, a ton. Um, so I get these big ideas, but then I don't know how to do them or, or if I do do them, um, they're very simplistic. So um, this is a monthly project report that we're about to um, introduce to our staff um, that allows you to go in and filter down what month, what year, and it will tell you how many new projects you have, how many active projects, how many projects you've closed, and then the total cost of each project based on either um, a, um, an arbitrary number or the actual number. And there's another, I, I keep calling out Thomas, but um, he, he did some great work with, uh, taking five fields and deciding which in order should be, you know, if one was empty, then we went, went to the other one. If that one was empty, we went to the total and that was what went in. So um, quite a bit of coding behind that. And, um, you know, it, it's, it's very um, in the works still, this whole thing, but uh, it works really, really well. And, um, we're trying to, uh, you know, make it even better. So thank you. Thank you for listening to me. Um, does anyone have any questions? Oh, well, I guess uh, just first, thank you, Fritz. Um, and I don't really have a question. I'm just going to make a statement that I'm never showing you one of the layouts I design ever again. So here we go. Uh, well, you know, uh, that's kind of the point of why I presented this is if I can help you guys, any of you with your projects, I am available for freelance work. <laughs> but um, I, I realize a lot of the work, the work that you guys do is uh, proprietary and, and um, pretty locked down. But um, I've tried to show that FileMaker can actually be used to, to um, to design great things and, and can be uh, more than just a series of clicks and buttons and, and reports. It, it can actually be kind of a, a user experience. You've definitely done a nice job with that. So well done. 
and I'm sure I and I kind of know what probably went on the back end. So well done to you as well, Thomas. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that, Todd. So uh, I have a Fritz. You mentioned fonts, and I dropped a link from uh, Goya. Uh, it goes back a while. Um, we we came up against some of the same issues. We had a number of years back a project that was to be deployed on Mac, Windows, and iOS. Uh -huh. So I went out and I, you know, to the internet and I looked to see what fonts would be most cross-platform at that time. I landed on Verdana or Verdana. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. And um, shout out to Nick Orr, who years ago did some analysis of which fonts were most compatible. And it um, right now we're using Verdana 11 on 15 because it's cross-platform Mac Windows. Sure. Um, but I'm wondering, you know, that all said, uh, how did you approach your font cross-platform compatibility challenges? Uh, well, I, I um, two two ways. Um, instead of Helvetica or Arial, I, I use the Mac native um, Helvetica Noia, um, which is built into the iPad, so it makes it really nice. Um, but the only that that's kind of the only thing I could do. Um, you'll see in this screenshot a lot of most of the fonts are either uh, ping logos like up at the top. So that's a that's an image file. But the things that have to be fonts, um, I just made sure that every one of our users had those fonts installed on their machine and they're open type fonts, um, which work with Mac or Windows. So as long as as long as your particular font is installed on on the user's machine, you shouldn't have a problem. It does become a problem with iPads. Um, and they they basically it all defaults to a sans serif um, such as Helvetica Noia or Arial. Um, but um, you know I realize the problems with with that. Um, but I know that some websites you can force font, you know, web fonts are very, very cool. Um, I just wish FileMaker could, um, you know, I mean, they're owned by Apple for Christ's sake. Why can't, why can't they, they have some sort of, you know, even like 20 fonts that are embedded in the program that are, that are more exciting than, um, but I suppose if you give people that, then they'll want like 200 more. So I'm not really sure what to do about that, but um, that's basically the answer. You know, make sure the fonts are installed on the, on the machines of your users or use uh, um, static graphic files. Yeah, and I'm I'm not even sure what the status of Verdana is. At one point, it was installed, I believe, with Internet Explorer, and I think at some point they pulled it. But uh, my final comment was that I learned from Nick. I had at one point done nine point for labels, and then I looked at his cross platform, and I changed from nine to ten. Um, but anyway, all right, yeah, cool. It looks real nice stuff. Thank you. I guess uh, I know we're we're uh, running ran a little bit longer than uh, normal, but uh, I don't mind sticking around if you guys don't. Um, I guess any other questions for Fritz? All right. Does anybody else have one more thing then? Something you want you learn, something you want to just uh, ask a question about. I have something I will ask if I if I may. Certainly. Um, the project I'm working on is uh, using uh, SQL as an external data source. 
And I think I've gotten a lot of that figured out, but there's a couple little things that are kind of tricky on that. And I was wondering if anyone else has had any experience doing that. And if so, maybe I could reach out to you separately and ask a couple of questions. Um, you said your SQL is an external data source. Does that mean are you using the ESS technology or what's your, what's your SQL flavor? Um, I don't know if I know how to answer that. <laughs> I use an ODBC connection to connect to a SQL data source. And then, so the table data doesn't actually live in FileMaker, it lives in SQL. So you can link up the tables, your, C your FileMaker tables directly to SQL. Okay, we, we did a project. And so there's a technology that we were using for a project. We moved away to a JSON implementation. FileMaker at some point, and maybe someone else can fill in the exact time, they implemented a, a product or feature that they called external SQL sources. Um, That's what I'm and, using. Okay, so you're using, <laughs> and, and, and they gave you the ability to connect to a, diff, a variety of different uh, SQLs. MySQL, Oracle, Microsoft SQL are the ones that come to mind. Later on, they added Postgres, I believe. Yeah, this is, this is uh, Microsoft. Uh, SQL server. Okay, so you're all right. So there's a good white paper out there that we relied on. And we were basically we're doing not that fancy. We were basically uh, we had a FileMaker application and there was a website with MySQL and we were basically we were pushing data up. Uh, users were interacting through the web interface and then we were subsequently pulling data down. So it was, it was pretty it wasn't a two-way sync. It was push it up, pull it down. Um, but what was your question? Um, <laughs> I won't go into the details of my question, but I'm looking for somebody that's done some of this, and I can pick their brain a little bit more, maybe offline. Okay. Uh, the 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 one thing I would say is a it works, but b we did have our server blow up, and this was kind of like a perhaps a dramatic and. What happened is our Amazon, we had a query, our Amazon server instance kind of blew up, you know, maxed out, and it actually crashed our FileMaker server and caused a very interesting week in my life. Oh, um, nice. Where I tried like a million, uh, you know, a, a lot of different things. And eventually we discovered that we had, uh, that the web, the Amazon instance was literally crashing the FileMaker Macintosh server. Like I didn't see that coming. But we optimized the query, put some metrics on the AWS, and lived happily to tell the tale. So just don't do that. Okay, good. <laughs> I won't, or not yeah. intentionally. Yeah, we've done that um, like a couple of different projects, Brad. So yeah, if you wanted to reach out, I, I don't know that I can't say that I'm an expert, but I can let you know what we've learned along the way. Well, I'll shoot you an email tomorrow, to Todd, then, and, and you can put me in touch with, I think it was Tony that was talking. So. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure I'll have any great wisdom. What I, I, I mean, actually, what I would say was interesting was, so this particular client was like our biggest lifetime client. And I got to tell you, it was really, really stressful when the server was crashed and I didn't know why. Um, but what they did, which I think is generally interesting, is they have Ruby on Rails team and they tasked us with building an interface. So we, we actually switched from ESS to doing a JSON uh let me see how simple i can put it we we have a robot machine running on an on timer that once a minute runs a query and pulls down 50 records at a time which is way more performant than what we had yeah and i've done that with my past experiences and i've i've used uh sql to push up you know using short procedures to push and pull data back and forth but this actually the data actually lives in microsoft sql so it's kind of cool <laughs> okay interesting and I have some really large tables that perform very slowly for the FileMaker side. So I'm trying to get them to write some archive utilities on the SQL side to give me less records. Uh, that's going to help performance a great deal. But anyway, thanks for listening. Sure. Um, and I'll throw my hat in the ring, too, if you want. You can also CC me or email me. We've done some stuff with, you know, connecting to SQL in the, in the recent past. <laughs> great. Thank you very much. Cool. Again, I don't have your email address, but I'll, I'll go through Todd and, and maybe he can pass them down for me. Thank you. Sure. If I can do that. Anybody else have uh, 
Question, comment? I just read that AWS is going to be installing Mac servers. So that's, oh, that's that might be interesting. Yeah. Starting in January, I think. Yeah, I, I saw that. What are they going to be using? The old XServe? No, uh, they're using Mac Minis, Mac is minis. what I read. Mac, Mac minis. minis. Oh yeah, my minis God. Wow. The, new, the new M1s. Yeah, with, with the M1s, right. Thomas, was that for like dedicated hosting or for server farm rendering? That I read a really brief article. I I thought it was for um, dedicated hosting. That's what I. That's how I read it. But I read it minutes before coming up here. Right. It's it's hot. It's late breaking news. Yeah. Does anyone have any uh, experience with the new M1 uh, processor and the, and the new um, Max? We do not. Mm -mm. I don't. I've been following it. Um, but from everything I've heard, it's it's uh, not quite there yet. Not time to buy one, especially if you're into professional work. Um, a lot of things don't. Uh, I, I know Adobe and Microsoft apps work, but not much else. Yeah, that's what I knew. Um, our sister company um, got a few to refresh some Mac minis that they have around and the because um, we could only update the high Sierra, so they needed to do something. And they you know, came with Big Sur. And when right. they went to install FileMaker on it, you had to stop and allow Rosetta to run in order to run, which uh, I'm sure right. FileMaker will have a Big Sur compatible version here shortly. But that was, you know, one of the other ones you know, to kind of go along with the, you know, some of the other apps that. Actually, that brings up a, a, a good question, Todd, if you know the answer to this. but. Um, uh, I have not been able to upgrade my FileMaker 19 beyond the initial version because any version beyond that um, forces me to, to put a FileMaker Cloud login when I don't have one. So it's, it's forcing you to, to put, um, I think like I mentioned the, the- What they call like the FileMaker ID? Yeah, FileMaker ID. Like, like, um, it it won't it won't recognize your 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 solution at your IP address. It'll it'll just default to well, you gotta in order to log in, you have to have a FileMaker Cloud ID. And I'm, of course, I don't have one of those. Or yeah. if I do, it probably belongs to you know the host, right? Admin. Yeah. So I'm I'm basically I haven't upgraded anyone in our department. And I'm just still running on the very first release of 19. I can't say that I've run into that issue on, you know, either for myself or any of our clients. Has anybody else seen a sim similar scenario? We, we have. We've run into it with the, not the current update, but the previous update. When we installed that, we had the same thing where we couldn't connect to cloud servers. Do you think they should make it in the very latest update, Thomas? The latest update seems to have resolved it. And this is an issue that found, uh, Claris knows about. Okay. And, and that's what, the 19.1.3? Yeah, we're on one four now. Is that a current? Is there a four now? Okay. Whatever is now, it was the, the previous one. Okay. Um, Anything, anybody else have question, comment? I've got a few things to I, wrap up, but. Uh, I that... just have a quick, quick comment, a quick comment that um, I've been doing IT for a long time and my kids grew up with always having computers in the house. And my son, who's a Windows guy, just switched to Catalina. He's doing a virtual, virtual, you know, VPS on it, on his Windows computer. And then we were talking, he said, he said, oh yeah, JSON is easy. And I'm like, oh crap, now I have to ask my son how to do JSON, because I haven't grasped it yet. <laughs> <laughs> so I've, I've gone this far without having to do it. He's 28. 
So I've gone this far, but I have never had to ask my children how to do stuff. They're always asking me. <laughs> so now I have a, this is my first time. I'm going to have to, he's going to have to show me how to use JSON. <laughs> I just thought I that was funny. That, that is was very funny. funny too, and I ask him those kind of questions all the time. <laughs> hey, Kim, uh, I dropped a link. Uh, we took a swing at JSON when uh, FileMaker 16 came out. We, uh, and Fritz might get a kick out of this. We, we do a lot of infographics. And once a year, we, we try and do a really good one. Um, we also do some scruffy ones. Um, but anyway, there's a link in the notes to our JSON infographic. All right, thank you. We got it. Thank you. It's just text. Anybody else? Okay, well, I'm going to go ahead and share here as we wrap up. But it's good. It's a good okay. thing. Okay, uh, so just um, a last, I don't know if anybody joined us, but we did a cross did a lunch and learn uh, last month. Uh, we're doing another one next Wednesday at noon. Uh, going into find mode, uh, just talking about some of the ins and outs. Uh, so if anybody wants to join us for a half an hour, uh, you can, uh, there, the information is there. Um, we'll just go past, there's server 19.1.2 and then 19.1.3 uh, for FileMaker Pro um, are the updates that are available. And then we're a LinkedIn group as well as a Slack group. So if you're interested in joining either of those, you can uh, contact Laura and get added if you want to keep the conversation going in between meetings. Uh, so we asked some questions here last month. Uh, the first one was about FileMaker Cloud. Um, had a, a smattering of responses in most categories, uh, but the majority are still people that want to see the servers where their data lives uh, when it comes to having you know stuff in the cloud. Second question we asked was uh, when building mobile, when building a new solution, does your development, you know, always include stuff for FileMaker Go? Sometimes, seldom, never. Um, and I'm hoping the group that responded to the last one was only joking, um, but uh, we'll, uh, hopefully nobody's still trying to run anything on Palm OS. So. Um, and then the uh, last question was uh, centered around Thanksgiving. Um, just you know, finding out what everybody has as part of their meal beyond uh, the turkey, and I can say with certainty that all FileMaker developers love mashed potatoes. So, and if that's not you and you didn't vote, then you know that's why you have to vote. So, um, that is cool. So uh, our next meeting uh, will be February third. Uh, we always take uh, the first week of January off just because of how close it is to the holidays. So the next meeting will be in February. Uh, the Claris Engage conference is coming, uh, but there's still been no word uh, as they're working to get things uh, rescheduled to get around the, you know, the conflicts with, uh, I believe it's Rosh Hashanah, um, to work around that. So it's coming, just no dates yet. Um, and then uh, Wonder Woman 1984 uh, will arrive here before the end of the year if you're eagerly waiting for the sequel. Um, and then uh, just because it's far enough out that our next topic at our next meeting is yet to be determined, uh, so stay tuned. Um, there will be a survey. Uh, you'll probably get the email for that link uh, probably sometime uh, tomorrow afternoon, uh, I'm guessing. So, um, and that's pretty much it. And I guess just kind of conclude with uh, thank you to uh, Fritz and Dan for uh, sharing their uh, solutions with us. Well done, gentlemen, and thank you for joining us. I guess uh, thanks to everybody for taking some time out of your evening. Uh, I guess anybody have anything else before we call it a day? Thanks for the show. Thanks, guys. You're very welcome. Thanks for the presentations. Thank you. See you later. Oh, my God. Have a great night, everyone, and thanks again for joining us. Okay, bye. Okay, thanks, all. Happy holidays. Bye. Yep. Bye.